Uh, thank you all very much for coming. Um, this session is hopefully going to be quite nicely interactive. Certainly, if you've got any questions or any thoughts as we go through, feel free to, to ask. Um, what, we're, what we're sort of doing a bit of an introduction to is how we feel design fits together with email. Um, email being a very different beast to other areas of marketing. Um, and uh, go over some of the benefits of using really great design as well as um, what maybe email design is and what it isn't. Um, a little bit about me, so I've been, I'm the head of digital design at Adestra, I've been with the company for just over a year now. Um, before that I was working um, for Dyson, running their digital production over in um, Chicago and that kind of involved lots of design stuff but also lots of developer stuff and also lots of marketing, so a bit of everything really. Um, so I kind of straddle the, the UX spectrum of design all the way through to you know, full-on development. Um, what we're going to go through are a few thoughts I've got about design with an email, a little bit about Air Charter Service, who are the, uh, the clients that this, uh, this kind of centred around this piece, um, and a little bit about the work we've done with them um, and where what the work we've done with them has left them. Um, and then talk a little bit about some more dynamic, personalised email content using the real-time email tool. Um, so it's a bit of a flowery statement to start off with. Uh, to design user interaction is to present a challenge to the user, one that they can either choose to accept or decline. And our job as designers is to make it as easy as possible for them to accept that. Um, let me give you an example. So a lot of, if you do a search on Google for something like great email design or good looking emails, you'll see a lot of pretty pictures. So you'll see things like this um, and like this. And they're really great. They get across the brands really well. Um, makes the email really easy to build from a development point of view. It's just a big image with an A tag around it. Um, and they end up on lists of really great looking emails like these ones did. There's one really big downside to this approach, and that's that, as we've just seen Steve talking about. Um, but that's not the end of the story. So if we're, saying we're not just about using pretty pictures, what are we using instead? Well, here's one that we did, and there's quite a lot of pretty pictures in there. Um, but there's a difference in the way that we've approached this to some of those other examples. So this is this email in real life. If we turn images off, What are we left with? Well, actually, we're left with the same content. What we really wanted to tell people with this email is that there's a $25 off their winter collection. And we want to tell them what else the business uh, sells. And we want to give some secondary messaging down here. But the fact that the image isn't there isn't the end of the world. That was just supporting what the content had, what the message was. And that's what's really important. What you, when you're emailing people, you're giving them a message and you want to tell them what that message is. You want to help them understand why that message resonates with them, and you want to give them some indication about what they should do with that. So all of that, all of those key ingredients are still there. The images are just there to support that. The other really good reason for not just using images is, um, is when you come to look at mobile interaction. When you send email, emails to people on mobile, and it's just a big image with lots of text in, as that shrinks down, so does your text. And all of these things are putting those barriers back in place between your message and the user accepting that challenge. So for example, on this one with the mobile approach, we don't really care what size your screen is, we are going to give you the same message and we're going to allow you to interact with the email in the same way. You've still got a menu, <coughs> you've still got the key pieces of information and you still can see some of the emotion-led stuff of why you should engage with that. Um, so I said, well, the, the, the main piece of this uh, <coughs> is to go through some work that we did with Air Charter Service. Um, we, um, I was two days into the job when Henry came to me and said, we've got these guys that we really want to get a good working relationship with. It's really important. Go and get involved. And I've kind of worked with them ever since. Um, they've very quickly become one of our favorite clients, not least because they let us do cool stuff in email. Um, so um, we've got uh, Vicky here from Air Charter who's going to give you a little bit of background of the company and some of the challenges that they were presented with for email. Um, Vicky's worked with um, CRM for the last six years 
formerly at the Institute of Design and Direct Mailing. <laughs> Design, <laughs> oh, Institute of Digital Direct, Direct and Digital Marketing. <laughs> <laughs> you know I was going to get that wrong without my notes. We like um, design as well. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so it was a really great, really great <laughs> learning ground for CRM. We were talking earlier about that being the equivalent to kind of eight years somewhere where you're the only CRM person because you're working in an area that is all about building communication relationships with customers. And then for the last 18 months, she's been working with their charter service, primarily with their emails. So I'll hand over to her. Cool, thank you. <sighs> Hello. I um, just want to say that I am um, a bit of a late addition to um, the schedule today. <laughs> My colleague Rebecca was supposed to be presenting, but she um, got held up, so um, I've stepped in. So just in case there are any delays. Excuses or, in early. Yes, excuses <laughs> in early. Any <laughs> bad bits. Um, so um, Air Charter Service um, would I'm help sorry. if I put it on. Oh. Oh, my bad. Cool. There we go. There we go. Um, so as the name suggests, um, it's quite quite a good name. Um, we charter aeroplanes. Um, it's not a brand that most people know because um, chartering involves quite a lot of money. Um, particularly the, in the private jet sector, um, where you are spending a fair amount just to go maybe from London to France. Um, we've actually been going for 25 years. We started in 1990. I say we, it was actually um, our chairman, Chris Leach, who um, founded the company. He, um, he sort of grew up in aviation. He was actually born at Stansted Airfield, so it was very much in his blood. Um, and in 1990, he decided to have a go at chartering for cargo in the basement of his home um, in Kingston upon Thames, which is actually near to where we're based today. Um, so it's kind of gone from one man chartering um, to 25 years later, um, three divisions, group charters, cargo and private. Um, and we've actually now got three new additions. Um, aircraft sales, so we are now starting to buy and sell aircraft as well as just chartering. Emergency response for um, people that maybe have personnel in uh, remote and hostile locations. Um, um, so like if, if they ever need to be evacuated, we're on call for them, <coughs> an onboard courier. So if you don't quite have enough, to, enough freight to, to charter a whole plane, we can actually, if it's quite a small package, um, charter it or we can take it on board a scheduled flight. So the company kind of in the sort of early noughties had about 15 members of staff but we had an office in Russia. Um, we've now grown massively in the last 15 years from 15 people to 300 so it kind of gives you an idea of the scale of, of marketing that we're having to do. Um, we've got offices pretty much on every continent about 19 so our marketing department is has grown rapidly but we're still kind of centrally based so we're having to do a lot of it in our um, head office in Surbiton and I actually work in the direct marketing team and there's only three of us and that involves direct mail as well as email so we have a lot to do um, I started about yeah 18 months ago and when I um, joined ACS um, we were actually using an ESP that were quite small, couldn't quite offer us the support that we needed. Our um, designs were looking a little bit tired. They didn't quite go with the, the brand image, the professionalism, and obviously the size as well. So um, we had very much set ourselves some challenges that we needed to um, tackle, um, one of them being finding a new ESP who could help us. Um, so we needed somebody who could kind of form an extension to our own internal team, reduce man hours because with just three people, you're obviously wasting quite a bit of time um, doing emails that are going out to 19 offices in up to nine languages for three divisions. So you multiply that and it can be like 40, 50 campaigns. So pr pretty time consuming. Obviously, with not enough man hours, um, we didn't have enough time to properly analyse and we kind of needed people who could focus on what we were doing well, what we weren't, and obviously trying to breathe new life into our emails. Um, one of the big things is that um, 
our company with the massive growth where they were investing a fair amount into digital marketing. First being our websites. Um, as you can see, this is one of the last websites um, that still still around in our old format. Obviously it's in Chinese, but you can still see that there's a lot of information on there. It doesn't look great. Um, many buttons down the side, it's not a very good user experience. Um, so beginning of this year, we rolled out um, a brand new .com website and then a local website for each one of our local, of, um, local markets. So each office essentially had its own site in its language. Um, and it was tailored for their different business needs, um, which was brilliant, really exciting. It meant though that our email marketing was lagging, so we still had a design that didn't quite fit um, and a little bit embarrassing when we had these flash amazing sites, particularly with an image with a really cool little reflection on the top. <laughs> it's like my favorite bit. Oh, can you see it? Oh no, it's not. Yeah. Oh damn! Oh well, oh well. <laughs> um, <laughs> it is really cool. It is really cool. <laughs> Rob never gets tired of it. <laughs> um, so, so that's where um, we approached um, Adestra, and we kind of said, "Well, we need to completely overhaul our email marketing, and I think we need to start with the look and feel, really." because we've got these flash new websites and we our emails have to match up to that because it just it they, they just be so disjointed otherwise. Um, so we decided to start with a campaign um, which has been going out, it's been around for quite a few years. Um, it goes out every month to all of our cargo customers. Um, the idea is it's a last minute availability. So similar to where you get like last minute notifications, um, to kind of say buy now. Um, we would send it out to all of our cargo contacts, um, listing any of the availabilities for cargo flights, where they're leaving. We do one for each market. So for every single office, they would get their own regional email in, a, in the appropriate language. Um, but we, that was taking so much time. Um, we actually had one resource on it for working for probably about a week out of every month so that's a week out four weeks in a month um, which time that we just didn't need and actually the response rate that we were getting from it was was not great and it didn't really warrant the amount of time so um, so we took this as the first campaign to sort of really focus on and um, we um, worked really well with Rob he him and the team completely redesigned it um, and yeah he's gonna kind of talk through what happened <laughs> Um, yeah, so we had a couple of quick wins when it came to looking at this template. Um, obviously, lovely new website, that gave us some nice starting points. We can make use of those full blocks of colour, some full width uh, sections for the header, the footer. We had some nice clear call to action buttons, quite easy to represent the brand and stuff. Um, one of the targets was that no one had ever clicked through from the old email that was going out. It's quite an easy, quite an easy hurdle to jump over, get one <laughs> result. But, um, but what they did have was at the top of the email was a phone number. So, so you got the email, you opened it, you saw a phone number, a massive picture of a plane, and then some feet <laughs> below that, some actual information. So it was, quite, it was a bit of a no-brainer again to move the call to action higher and maybe move the phone number down to more of a supporting role. And then what we also wanted to do is consider the onward journey. So if people are going to click through, let's make the next bit really easy for them as well. There was one sticking point for us though, and this is from the old template. This is the information, this is the only thing that really matters in the email is you understand what this is. Even on its own, it's quite tricky to, look, to read. There's quite a lot of information really tightly packed next to each other. Um, no way of kind of reacting to any one of those things. And most importantly, that has a massive wadge of content to try and get onto a mobile device in any way that's meaningful. Anyone who's ever tried to get tabular data onto mobile in a meaningful way will understand the challenge that that um, presents. <clears throat> so we did a couple of things. So first of all, desktop. This was a simpler approach, more to try and kind of make you feel a little bit more lighthearted, make it look like a departures board basically, but keep the information nice and clear, separated. The ability to react to, I'm interested in this, therefore I can immediately react. I don't need to look through everything in order to know what I want. 
But we still had the problem for mobile because this still doesn't present itself nicely to mobile. So we did something a little bit different for mobile. Uh, and this is what the mobile version actually looks like. So exactly the same code base, um, but a completely interactive and hopefully intuitive um, presentation of the, of the template. I'll show you the, um, the finished uh, complete piece. Um, so this, this is now what you get. So you've got a nice clear call to action uh, up top, then you've got the key pieces of information, and then the bottom half of the email is more about reassurance. So this is the company that you trust. There's a plane. Uh, there's some really kind of nice supporting bits of content. Um, again, it's, it's kind of device aware. So as we, as we shrink the screen size down, left-handed. There we go. Um, you can see the email basically transforms into a different experience where we're actually using hovers which don't exist on mobile, so you've got a tap interaction to drop those bits of content down. And then even down here, if you're on mobile, we'll tell you about the, the Aircraft Guide app. If you're on desktop, we'll allow you to download a PDF. So it's all about getting the message across to the people in the context that they're experiencing that message in. Uh, and not trying to design for everything. A lot of people talk about mobile first, and a lot of people talk about uh, mobile responsive, and I think the real key is somewhere in between, and it's, again, it's what's the content, what's the message you want to get across to somebody. When people talk about mobile first, they say, well, look at our stats, we've got 50% of people now opening on mobile. Well, that's still 50% that are opening on desktop, and if you just design for mobile, then you're still ignoring half of your audience. And just responsive, we're trying to get that table of data to work on a responsive thing where everything's just flowing underneath each other is, is not necessarily going to present it any easier. So I really am a real advocate for understanding the context of where people might be and kind of coding or designing around that. Um, and then I mentioned the onward journey. So we've got a couple of buttons. We've got that get quote button at the top, which is more of a generic, I'm interested in something. And then we've got the, the specific get fast quote buttons there. Um, so the onward journey goes to a form. If you click the Get the Quote button, then we'll just give you an open form. You can tell us about what you actually need. If you have expressed an interest in a particular flight, though, we'll pre-fill that with the information for, about the flight, all of your information. So all you actually then need to do is fill in one more field, and you're done. You've got the information across to, to Air Charter. They can deal with that much more efficiently, and it, it didn't feel like an onerous task for you as a, as a user. Now, as Vicky mentioned, this goes out in nine different languages to 12 different locations. Um, so what this also does is, on the one form, understand what language you were in. So if you get a French version of the email, the form is in French, that then sends you to a thank you page, which is in French, with local information about the offices in France, and then redirects you to the website. So I spent a lot of time and effort on the website. Let's keep people online, and let's, they've chosen to interact with a digital offering. Don't make them then have to phone up. Let's keep them engaged. Um, and the end, Russian as well. For some reason, I felt like showing the Russian version would be even more impressive than the, the French. Get the idea. Um, so I'm just going to hand back to Vicky to talk about how what all of this has meant to, to them as a business. Oh, oh, oh dear. It's fine. <laughs> <Sorry. It's replaceable. laughs> um, so yeah, as Rob demonstrated, um, him and his team obviously did a brilliant job with the design, but also. Um, introducing us to some really exciting new technologies which was amazing considering that we went from just quite a simple email that wasn't responsive at all to something that now had that was completely email responsive had really cool uh, tables the drop the drop downs obviously that had never been done before um, so really exciting for us to get something so new um, and it was great that taking this first campaign um, <coughs> our directors were able to see that okay we've straight away we've we've managed to completely um, overhaul everything and streamline it to the point where we're spending le less time um, everything's got a consistent look um, by having it managed for us we're spending less than a day a month on um, doing the actual work um, it, it gets approved really straightforward. Like one email goes to um, each office, they can check it, and it's approved, and there are no uh, discrepancies between emails because it's all managed in house. Um, and just overall, it's been really, really great process. Um, and it's kind of from there that we've 
taken um, loads of new styles and we've kind of created this like style guide in a way, which has meant that um, <coughs> we've been able to focus on some really cool new templates um, and emails for different campaigns, um, which Rob is going to talk about. So. Um, yeah, so we, it was great. We got a really great level of buy-in from, from everyone in the business at, at AirChat, which did give us a really good platform then to keep trying new stuff and to keep trying to push stuff forward. So this is the welcome campaign that we um, we did for them. Again, what we want is a nice big initial impact to make you feel like this is something different. I, I talk a lot to my team about the, the noise that we're aiming to elicit from people is a kind of, oh, not a, oh my God, my mind's blown. It's, a, it's, a, it's more subtle than that. It's making people pause as they look through their inbox, inbox, their inbox, <laughs> and, uh, and take note of the message that you're trying to say. They're so busy in their, in, in their inboxes that just doing something a little bit different can have a big effect. Um, this one, for example, we've got the big image, and then we do spend some time just reassuring you that this is the brand that you thought you were being welcomed into. Um, and then having a nice, another nice big section down below to give you, again, some nice reassurance around being able to contact people at whatever time. And then on mobile, more subtle than the, um, than the first template, but still a nice little touch just to make you feel like this is something different that you're not gonna see every time you, um, you get an email from someone. And then the last, um, come on, there we go. the last piece I just wanted to show you was, um, for a launch of a new brand um, for AirChat, which is this uh, Imperium brand. This is something we can probably all relate to. This allows you to basically have an Oyster card for booking private jets. So we've, we've all got two or three of those. <coughs> um, this is a brand new brand, like, brand, like we say, and, and obviously it's for aspirational, highly affluent people. So we, we wanted to make sure that they understood what the brand was and that we were representing the brand really nicely. So we've got an embedded video at the top which uh, is provided by the real-time email tool. And what that means is that this, is, this will detect what device you're viewing email on and uh, react accordingly. It'll either show you the video if you're in an uh, Apple device, um, certainly on a Mac or in, um, in some of the webmail uh, browsers. It will play the video in the email. If you're not, but it's, you're in a browser that supports um, animated GIFs, it will show you the animated GIF. And finally, if you're not in it, on anything that supports anything, Outlook or, or Gmail, you'll get a static image which will just link through to the uh, to play the video. So that was the first piece. So we wanted to give people the, the option of being able to see um, a little bit more about the brand. And then just as a kind of final look how close this is to being yours, we have this personalized image at the bottom which shows the card with the customer's name already on it. So it's almost like you can reach in and you're just you're nearly at that point where you can book your planes with a text message um, and again that was made possible by the real-time email um, functionality so that will either pull in the name if we've got that customer data if we haven't it will fall back to an image where it's got uh, the Eric Limbo name on uh, on there instead um, which gives me a nice little opportunity to hand you over to Dave to talk a little bit more about the real-time email is there any questions on anything we've, we've covered so far just before I do cool Hi everyone, I'm Dave Holland. Um, the company is Live Clicker. We've got a slide coming yeah, up. Yeah, there we go. The company is Live Clicker, the brand is real time email. Uh, next slide, actually. If I can there you have that. Have the Live Clicker. Um, we are based in San Jose, California. We work with uh, 1,200 enterprise brands globally, and I'm the European EMEA uh, Director, Business Development Director for the company. Um, we actually have 10 different ways that you can get dynamic content into your emails. And by that I mean 10 different ways in the sense of 10 different types of dynamic content. So what do we mean when we say dynamic? What, what exactly? Let's define that just for a second. So what we mean is that the content is actually um, dynamic and relevant in real time. That's at the point that the person opens the email, not when you sent it. So you may have sent your email as you should have done on Tuesday afternoon, but they may not have opened on Tuesday afternoon. They may have opened on Wednesday afternoon. The content that you wanted to deliver um, on the Tuesday, you want it to be relevant on the Wednesday. So if it's a social feed where the latest post in Twitter was actually at midday on Wednesday, even though you sent your email out on Tuesday at lunchtime, it's actually going to show Wednesday's post, Twitter post, in the email. 
at the point of opening. If they close the email and open again on Thursday, guess what? It's going to be Thursday's latest tweets in the email. So that's what we mean by dynamic. It means real time in the now, at the moment that they open the email, not when you send it necessarily. So we've already had a great example of a video. Um, we own a global pattern that detects the device, the email client, and the bandwidth of the recipient. And we have 12 different video files of your video in the cloud, and we deliver the relevant result um, on the fly. So if you open on one device in the morning, a second different device email client in the afternoon, you're going to potentially get a different result. But it'll always be a great result. You'll never get a broken video. Um, when we engage with people, and um, Destra is, a, is one of our key partners in the UK, and when, I know when they engage with you when, around the subject of dynamic elements, the first questions that they're going to be asking are, where, where is, what is it you're actually trying to achieve in the, in the customer journey with the particular emails that you're even considering putting dynamic elements in? We've got thousands of case studies, hundreds and hundreds of clients that we can draw on to help advise on what's going to be the right element. Is it a timer? Is it going to be a map? Uh, is it going to be an image with the, somebody's name on it? What's going to work? So we can help you at every stage. Video we've talked about. Timers, here's a nice little bit of best practice most people don't think about with the timer. Yes, the timer is going to be counting down in the email, the seconds will be ticking, unless you're in Microsoft Office Outlook, in which case they don't allow an animated GIF, but the seconds will be ticking. What you probably didn't realize is that you could actually swap out different images on different days. So three days out from the deadline, you could have one image. Two days out, they open, it's a different image. You've upped the game, you've made it more exciting, you've maybe made it feel more urgent. And the last day, you've got another different, completely different image and you can completely customize the timer. You can even have individual timers. We've got a bank who sends out a month in advance the renewal for your credit card bonus point scheme that you've signed up for. That time is individual because you, everybody's on a different, you know, the day they signed up is different for everybody. So we've got individual timers as well. I just wanted to talk about one other thing is, excuse the, the format, me passing to Rob and it, it, it got a bit messed up. But anyway, so, these are all the things that you can add yet another layer of, of dynamic and personalization, which you probably didn't even know existed. And that is that we will read at the moment of open the device they're opening on. We can read what the weather's like outside right now. We can detect the language, their preferred language in their email client. These are all things that you wouldn't necessarily know in advance. We can even tell you which city they're in. So even though you think they live in London, which they probably do, but today they happen to be in Amsterdam, and they're opening in Amsterdam. Maybe there's something, a different message you would like to give them because they're opening in Amsterdam, not London, and so on. So the, there's about 24 different ways that you can personalize yet another layer to make it feel as though you, you the vendor, sending to me, the end user, a, an email that was actually designed just for me. Um, so. One other thought off the back of that is, uh, that was whether location. We can actually deliver a map in real time for where you're standing right now, if you're on your mobile device, when you're opening your email. So if, you've, if you're a retailer particularly, this is great news, or if you're an event organizer, or you're a betting company and you're trying to draw people's attention to a sporting event that might be going on nearby, then we can actually detect through their IP address where they have to be right now. You're not going to know that in advance. And what's great news, when you summarize it all up, is that at the end of all of this, we give you back all of that data. So you can start building even greater individual profiles on end users to be able to do future segmentation, to be able to do more strategy that's centered around each individual user. I promised I'd finish bang on three o'clock. It's all yours. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. <coughs> Thanks. Um, so we've got a little bit of time left. Uh, if there are any questions on any of Dave's stuff, any general emails, design stuff, or anything else that you know that touches <coughs> on any of those subjects from anything from today. <coughs> but so you say that the gifts are not working out. Book. Yeah. What would you replace them with? Just a static image, or? Yeah. Well, so. It depends what, which way you're going. If you're if you're putting just a GIF in without using the, the real-time uh, media stuff, um, sorry, real-time email stuff, 
then the GIF will show, but it'll only show the first frame. And that's quite important. So if you've got you know, something that's appearing in the GIF, then the first frame will be blank. So it's probably not the best way to go with it. Um, you can obviously, you can also do detection if you can tell whether you're in Outlook or not, basically, which is the, the main place that GIFs are not going to work. So you, there's a little bit of code that you can stick in and say, if it's Outlook, do this. And if it's not Outlook, do something else. A good example of where we use that is in um, uh, in these sorts of templates. If we were doing something like this, where we've got that full width background image, uh, that would push all of the content over to the side in, in Outlook. So what we do there is we trim that down and have an Outlook version of that email. So it's the same email, but it would just say, well, if it's Outlook, then we're going to show a 600 pixel wide image. If it's not, we'll show the, the full thing. So there's a, there's a few different ways around it, and that's probably the easiest, but a little bit of work for somebody to do. <laughs> Anything else? Was there a specific approach to um, designing the mobile version for ACS? Yes, thank you for asking. <laughs> Anytime. Naturally done. <laughs> um, I think, I, so the, 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 like, the reason I wanted to, to touch on that a little bit is because it is, I think for, for mobile behavior generally, it's quite a common piece of interaction. So if you were on a mobile website or if you're an app, that kind of plus minus bit is, is fairly intuitive. But in an email where you're not expecting it, um, it's probably not so much. So what we did when we were first thinking about doing something like that, was just build the email with just that bit in and send it to loads of people in the ACS office and loads of people in the Adestra office and then go and bother them and say, I've just sent you an email, can you look at it on your phone and, and I just want to watch you do some stuff with it and just see if people got it. And, and they did. But that's kind of, we, we always try with every project that we take on to do something new and innovative and sometimes that's with, with tools like real-time e email or sometimes it's with using bits of CSS animation or GIFs or um, all of you will have seen the email summit um, invite emails that have been coming out from us. And I don't know how many of you opened those on to other things than Outlook, but if you opened it in uh, Gmail, for example, you'll have seen an animated GIF of those clouds moving. If you've opened it in on a Mac, you'll have seen some CSS animation of those clouds moving. So we try and do stuff like that where we can. But again, it's all to do with supporting the message rather than just um, that, that's the whole point of the email is just to show that and then you've got a few bits of copy down below because that's where you run into problems if people haven't got a browser that happens to support the thing you're trying to do. On the new editor, would that sort of thing be quite easy to do? Well, so I've worked really closely with Dan on this and, the, and the, my one key thing, I mean, I've moaned him a lot <laughs> about he what did. I wanted to he do. A lot. <laughs> <laughs> but my one, my one kind of baseline was the new editor can't stop us doing really cool stuff. We want it to enable us to do cool stuff and hand it over. There are That has to be tempered a little bit, so you can't, you wouldn't be able to just go, I know with this I'm going to add in a whole new piece of CSS animation that's never been done in an email, because that's, you know, that is real cutting edge stuff, but it will completely support any bit of HTML that you can write for it. So if you can write HTML and put it in an email, then the editor will support that completely. Um, including things like further down the line being able to update a background image and have that put in all of the necessary Outlook code in order to support Outlook. Um, and really exciting stuff like the mobile stuff. So if you code stuff to only appear on mobile, when you switch into mobile view in the editor, that's when you can edit it. So in, at that point, you're editing the email specifically for mobile and specifically for for desktop, so you, you're getting the best of both worlds. Anything else? So once people have decided to invest in email design, would you say um, that they can expect a certain ROI on it? Um, that's a tricky one to prove, because you can put as much great design in as possible, but people can still fill that with rubbish content. So I mean, I, I come back to it being the message is the most important thing. And design, for me, especially with an email, does two things. It reassures or lifts people's expectations. So uh, most people will open an email if it's from a brand that they trust. When they see that, that has to fulfill what they were expecting. If you had an email from Apple and you opened it and there was a picture of an iPhone with a big round all over the top saying sale, 
you would feel betrayed in some way, and you, you would feel that like this isn't representing what I was expecting. Um, so, the, so that's part of it, and then the other part is about lifting, the, the helping the message get across in the best possible way. So there's some things you can do which will definitely give you a massive increase. We, we built some um, emails for Dobby's garden centers, and they, they designed the desktop version, we designed the mobile version, and the first campaign that they sent with the new templates had a 400% increase in click-throughs on mobile. Now that was quite an easy win because they didn't have a mobile version before, but people were engaging with the content. They were able to clearly see the what, which is the message, the why, which is the, the pretty pictures or the, you know, the, the fluffy content, and the how, which is the, the call to action, and they're able to engage with that really easily. So I think there's no silver bullet of saying, if you let us design this, millions <laughs> but it is definitely that it will never hurt because it because crap content in a crap template is still crap that's two craps <laughs> but like this is a speech of the end Double of team crap. america <laughs> <laughs> but yeah so you, you you're always going to elevate something but you're not necessarily going to say it's very difficult to put a, a price tag on it it's much more emotional um, and it's trying to stop people and get them to at least read the, the email as they skip through their things, just desperately trying to get their red number on the phone screen down. Um, the cool table with the clicking all the plus and stuff. Yeah. Really what kind of testing did you do on that? Loads. <laughs> so um, we were basically targeting iPhones with that. Um, so there's a, that's probably a whole can of worms of what mobile means and um, and there's some things that is very very difficult to support so Gmail apps on a iPhone if people are stubborn enough that they want to use those that strips out all of your CSS and just basically ignores 90% of the code you've written as well and um, but then on Android there are there are ways of supporting mobile responsive stuff but again it's stripping out all of the, the clever stuff at the top that's detecting what size the screen is so you, iPhone is really what we're targeting, and that's where we did most of our real-world testing. We have live devices to go and test stuff like that on. No, um, I mean, like, um, in terms of making, like, like, getting the customers to click, because it's two clicks to get to, so you can't see the information, right? So you've got to click, yeah. and see it, and, that, and you, So, again. again, it was a lot of testing with people that don't work. I think, was it Steve that mentioned this? And I said, talking to, to people that don't work in digital, and don't work in design, and don't work on, in tech. So sending to... <laughs> account managers sending to the, uh, the finance teams and just going around and seeing how people interact with it and whether they got it. And then there was also mm -hmm. some, a lot of work with, with the ACS guys on what's the key piece of information. Because yeah. we assumed that it would be the direction, but it might maybe it's the aircraft. Like, I, don't, I don't know yeah. what the difference maker is. Um, so, I mean, it's, if, we weren't, if we hadn't ended up so sure, we would have done probably more A-B testing with the first couple of cents to see what mm -hmm. people actually inter interacted with. But it's difficult because ideally, if that was a website, you'd have some event tracking on there, which leads JavaScript, which wouldn't work in an email. So there, there is an element of, of uh, fingers crossed. But, but certainly, we got our first, I, I watched the results coming in from that first, and we got our first click, and I closed down my computer and moonwalked out of the building. <laughs> <laughs> um, cool. So when it comes to personalization, yes. <laughs> and I can see it's on your screen there, yeah. would you say there's like a specific way of how you should use it? Um, no, it, I mean, it, as we loads of people have said today how important personalization is, um, but that's not just about putting someone's name in it, that's a, that's a bit fluffy in this case, you could, that could just as easily say welcome to ACS. You've just had the interaction. This this goes out when they've had any interaction, I believe, isn't it? So phone or um, it's when they get added to the database. Right. Okay. So we allow like uh, about two weeks but because um, being a brokerage, we have our account managers who are, have to personally introduce the company to the new contacts, and then this um, follows up. But one thing we do do with it actually to make it a bit more personal is the hero image changes. So depending on which division they've. In inquired about or they, they've booked through, they would get a relevant image. So this one obviously is private jet um, for a private jet customer. If they've inquired about a um, commercial jet, so like a, a group jet, they would get um, an image that has a plane and lots of, it's kind of similar to, on the, actually I think we've got similar ones on the website. 
Oh, yeah, that's, yeah. Yeah. That's, I knew that, that's why I went. <laughs> I think the one we use is um, of people getting onto a plane to kind of show the sort of people going off on holiday using it for a, a big charter, and then obviously cargo, people with high vis jackets. So it makes it a lot more relevant for them rather than just having a picture of the plane. And, uh, and not that's the key word, I think, is it? Relevance yeah. is the more you feel like people are talking to you on a one-to-one -one basis, the more you will engage with it. Mm. We've all had stories where we've been retargeted in a way that really meant something, um, which is why we still keep using retargeting type stuff. So the, the more it feels like it's somebody talking to you, the better. And, and actually, I make this point with, we've done lots of work with different events companies, and something that I, I, I think not very many people do really good life cycle stuff within events. They'll keep sending the same email out over and over again, saying, oh, is this event coming? Come to this event. Remember this event I told you about? It's still going. <laughs> and, um, and, I, and I've talked to people, and something I hear quite a lot is, well, we haven't really got a lot of data about people, but my own is you have. If you look at how our automation program works and how we can understand what people have opened, what people have clicked, what people have gone on and transacted with, you can start with an e a list of people where you don't know anything except for their email address, and you can send that e an email to those people saying, we've got an event coming. You already know something about those people. You know the people that didn't engage with it at all, the people that engaged with the subject line but didn't click, click through, the people that did click through, and the people that bought. Well, now you've got four pots of people that you can talk to in a completely different way without even necessarily knowing their name. So now you, you can change the subject line for your first group, you can change the content for your second group, you can send a much more functional email for the, the people that click through. So it, you can build up knowledge about users without having to even get to the stage where you've got preference centers or, or things like that. And when you add that layer in and you add the stuff that Mark was talking about earlier with <coughs> the, the incentives for giving that information as well, you can really quickly build up a really a comprehensive database of, of personalization. Um, and because uh, it's, so it's not just about putting someone's name in an email or subject line, it's also about talking to them at the right time, understanding what sort of device they might be on, all of those things form what personalization is. Is there a risk when designing for, specifically for iPhone, that you're going to break it completely on the requirements? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we, we, te we, we test and test as much as we can. and. We, and every time there's a new a big OS release as well, we'll go back and test all of these sorts of things, and make sure that things aren't suddenly not working, especially in the you know iPhone and iPad stuff especially. But um, yeah, you, we we try and work with this is what we absolutely really want it to look like, and this is what is acceptable for it to look like in Lotus Notes 8 or something like that. Because, um, and, and it's the hardest thing is that there's always clients that are on Lotus Notes 7.5 or something, and you have to support them as far as they're concerned, but even then, no one else is using that. So we have like a, a baseline of this is the basic of what it's going to look like. So on a Gmail app, can you read what the content says? Yeah, brilliant, cool. Now let's get up to iPhones or Macs where everything's possible and, and you can do whatever you want and make it look really great. So yeah, we always make sure that we're, we're not completely ignoring those people, but if they can't have an animation or a video play, then that's, that's their fault using rubbish email. <laughs> 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 yeah, that's it, yeah. As long as we understand what the baseline is and what we're aiming for and the client's clear with, you know, this, you might get people to look at it like this, but actually looking at your reports, 6% of people are looking at it on this, and no one's looking at it on this, and you know you can make informed decisions about what you're going to do. Well, you could do different versions. <coughs> of that. Yeah, well, you could, and and there's a few ways you could do that. So you can obviously look at the even within the industry reports, you can see what device they're most likely to open on, and so you could filter people by that completely. Yeah, absolutely. There's one more. Has that iOS upgrade then actually caused massive problems? It hasn't. <laughs> hasn't caused any horrendous ones. Actually, the, the Air Chartered one, uh, they, there was a bug in iOS, and Dave, I'm sure, will, will talk to how much hassle they have with video every time the iOS changes. But we, so we've had stuff where suddenly we've had to tweak stuff to make it work, but we, we keep a kind of log of innovative and crazy stuff that we've done, so we go back and test every time there's a, a major release, and usually it's, it's a small change to make sure it keeps working. And, well, I say usually, that's if there is a change. It's very unusual. Like two weeks, or might be two weeks break. 
I, we, I mean, we wouldn't have anything broken for that long. I mean, we, we would test, test it all that day, and usually we can find stuff pretty quickly. If we, and if we know there's a release coming, we, with major clients, we actually pre-warn them, just hold off maybe, or, or yeah. let's rethink if there's a live campaign actually running. So. Cool, I think we're, we're pretty much done. Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks.